Hey everyone, welcome to the Data Umbrella webinar for July. Uh, I'm going to do a brief introduction and then Liz is going to do her talk and uh, we'll open it up for Q&A at the end, but you can ask questions either in the chat or the Q&A at any time and um, we'll, you know, we'll get those answered. Sometimes it's an easy break to interrupt the speaker, sometimes it's not, but don't worry. Um, by the end of the webinar, we will get all questions answered. This talk is being recorded and it is usually up on YouTube within a day, unless I have to do some editing and then it could be a little bit longer, but we can, you know, probably about a day. And I will share the link to the YouTube in the chat as well. So if you want, you can subscribe to YouTube and then you'll get a notification about when it's available. A little bit about Data Umbrella. We are an inclusive community for underrepresented persons in data science, and we are volunteer run. Uh, my name is Reshma Sheikh. I am a statistician by, by training. Um, and if you, you can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, or GitHub with the handle Reshma S. Um, we have a code of conduct. Um, our goal is to make this a welcoming, friendly community for all. Um, and so we really love it when everybody um, contributes to making that happen. There are a number of ways that you can support Data Umbrella. The first and foremost one is following our code of conduct and creating a community that is collaborative and welcoming. Um, the second is we have a Discord channel, which is available. The link to it is available on our website. And it's a place to ask and answer questions and share anything that you would like. Um, and then we also have transcripts of our webinars on GitHub if you would like to contribute to um, transcribing our webinars. Uh, you can also donate to our open collective. Um, and uh, that helps us cover our meetup costs and other, um, other expenses. We have a video library on YouTube now. Um, we've been doing webinars for over a year now. And so one of our tracks is contributing to open source. Um, we have Pandas and um, Scikit-Learn. Um, there's a lot of, um, if you're interested in, you know, learning more about open source, which is um, really important in the data science data field these days, there's information there. Uh, we also have a playlist for career advice of three really excellent speakers. Um, so check that out if you are in the job market. Um, great tips there. And here's just um, a, a small collection of some of the videos that we have in our library. We also have a job board. It's jobs.dataumbrella.org. If you're looking for a job, check it out. If you work for a company um, and you have a job to share, feel free to post it. Um, it can be posted there um, for free. Um, also with the job board, you can subscribe to it so you can get weekly updates on which uh, new jobs have been posted. On our website, we have a lot of resources um, about conferences, open source, um, a lot of, um, guides to using inclusive language and contributing to diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, so if you want to learn more about it, there's a lot of resources there. We are on many, many social media platforms as Data Umbrella. The primary one to find out about upcoming events is the Meetup group. Um, the YouTube channel is the one that has videos. Uh, I've mentioned the job board and um, I also share a lot of jobs on LinkedIn for Data Umbrella. So if you want to follow Data Umbrella on LinkedIn, I'll share the link in the chat as well. And we are on Twitter. So I want to introduce today's speaker, Liz. Liz is a returning speaker. Um, Liz specializes in organizational strategy, program evaluation, and adult learning. Um, Liz has a history of facilitating organizational development of evaluation processes and data-informed cultural change. Her work is rooted in participatory methodology and a strengths-based approach. Liz is currently a PhD candidate at the University of New Hampshire. And you can find Liz um, on LinkedIn um, at Liz and also on Twitter at Liz DeLuzio. Thanks, Reshima. Oh, actually, I just have a couple more announcements. Um, we have uh, two upcoming events. We have on July 27th, which is two weeks from today, we have a Pandas um, 
a webinar with Sam Bear, who is also a returning speaker. And then our August event is Modern Time Series Analysis with Stumpy. I believe that's how you say it, with Sean Law. Um, and the way to find out about that is on Meetup. And I will share that link in the chat. And now we can get started. I'll turn off my camera and microphone and hand it over to Liz. Beautiful. Thanks, Rishima. And welcome to all of you. Um, let me share my screen. Or Rashima, can you activate so that my screen is sharing now? There we go. All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, so it's nice to meet many of you. I saw many of you checked in in the chat box. Feel free to keep checking in. Just let us know who you are, where you're coming in from. Um, maybe even what you're interested in, what what made you tune in today. I always love hearing your stories. Um, so the other thing that I'll do is share in the chat box a link to the slides for today. Um, if you're tuning into this afterwards on YouTube, you can follow that bit.ly link. It will be up in perpetuity. Um, so the purpose of my slides are twofold. Number one is you can follow along with me as I am kind of walking you through this demo. Um, but then two, it's a resource guide for you. If you remember, hey, I saw this really cool thing that Liz did in the webinar. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I do have the link to her slides. You can scroll through and I take screenshots of all of the steps as I go. So with that being said, with no further ado, because I know we don't have too, too much time, just really quickly, um, I was laughing as um, Cecily, you shared that you saw you'd never learn Excel because you're an arts major and I was in so much the same boat. So I am um, in my first life, I was a special education teacher. I taught in New Jersey for six years before going back to get my master's in social work and in public health. And I fell into the field of evaluation. I took one class in it and I fell in love. And it's this idea that we take um, research, basically applied research, and we help organizations to thrive, to, to work better, to become data driven in their own way. And um, in that way, I now am in Excel where, you know, in my my BS program, bachelor's of science program, um, I had to take an Excel class and I was like, I sat in the back. When am I ever going to need this numbers and cells and formulas? Um, and now I teach it, which is hysterical to me. Um, but I love it. And I hope to even just share some of that love with you. Um, I do I do um, have my base uh, in, in um, analysis skills, learning in Excel, but I've branched out because it is limited. And I, you know, folks have their feelings one way or the other about what we use when it comes to analysis. What I will say is that it is the core um, of data analysis. Most folks learn with Excel and then grow from there. And so it's worth knowing. It's worth knowing the basics. Um, for me, when I work with folks um, who are less skilled in the analytic world, Excel is the platform that we work in. I'm not going to put somebody who is not familiar with uh, data analysis into R immediately or Python. That would be crazy. Also, when I'm creating templates for folks to use in their own work, I'm doing that in Excel as well. And so it is a platform that is just really common and it's worth knowing. It's worth being up to snuff with. Um, so just a couple ground rules really quickly before I begin. The first one and most important to me is to please be curious and ask questions. I am checking the chat box um, as I'm speaking to just see what questions you have. I have an agenda for what I want to get through today. I have so much on my agenda that I don't even think I'm going to get through it anyway. You'll have the slides um, to follow up on anything that I don't cover. But mostly, I just want to see what you're curious about. Or if I'm saying something that reminds you of something else that you've wondered how to do or you're running into trouble duplicating what I'm doing, please just let me know. Communicate with me in the chat box and we'll, we'll troubleshoot what's going on with you. And then the other thing is just be present. Um, so we're only here for another 45 minutes together. Um, it's kudos to you for taking the time out of your day to build your skills and let's let's get you there. Let's meet your goals. So just really quickly, um, you know, we talked about the pros and cons of Excel, just to run through them um, relatively quickly. 
Excel is easy to use, certainly more easy than anything that requires coding. It's very visual. It has lots of features and functions. It really is impressive, some of the things that you can do in there that you might not have thought. I feel like I'm learning new things about what you can do in there every day. One, because I just don't know all the corners of Excel. And then two, because they're continually adding more capabilities. It's easy to make charts in Excel. Um, and it does a lot of the formatting for you, which can be a good thing and a bad thing, depending on how it does with the formatting. But there are certainly drawbacks to Excel, and they're worth noting. Um, the first one is that it's not very intuitive. Um, it will really need to be the driver of the tool, much like any other data analysis platform. It can be hard to find the features that you're looking for, um, and they certainly keep moving things around with their new updates. There are lots of features and functions, and so that was a pro, and it can also be a con. It can be overwhelming for folks, especially if they're newer to the platform. It's really easy to make bad charts, and you're really limited in what you can make. I was sharing before that I've just started exploring what data analysis, um, specifically visualization, is like in R, and it is mind-blowing what is possible, which is really anything um, that you, you put your creativity to. Um, and that's not necessarily the case with Excel. It has its certain number of, of visualizations. And while they are diverse, um, there's certainly limitations to what you can do. Oops. It's a nice starter pack, I would say, for analysis. Um, only beginner slash intermediate level chart making capabilities, as I was sharing here. Um, if you're looking for something more advanced when it comes to creating visualizations, you might consider something like Tableau. I just saw somebody was in a boot camp and started learning about that. Um, same thing with R, Python. They have really great capabilities when it comes to visualizing. If you're looking to make more maps, GIS, a platform is really good. So ArcGIS, QGIS, that's free version um, or it's open source version. Um, another drawback of Excel is it does a lot of the formatting for you. Again, it's a pro and it's a con depending on how well it does. Complex analyses can get tedious or complicated really quickly in Excel, um, where it gets to a point where you're doing so much to work around Excel that it's easier to just learn a different platform. Um, and so with that being said, you might consider a statistical computing tool um, or language such as R or SAS for these more complex analyses or these larger data sets that Excel just can't handle. So when it comes to just thinking about analytics, I typically break them down into five different buckets. We've got aggregating, so that's anytime that we're bringing numbers together and looking at sums and uh, trends across numbers. We've got the visualization, we've talked about that a little bit already. There's sorting, there's manipulating, and there's filtering. So when I'm talking about manipulating, I'm talking about um, to, to change the data to a format that you're looking for. So with these five buckets, I want to just give you a really quick crash course in what's possible, the basics when it comes to, and hopefully a little extra, um, when it comes to what you can do in Excel. And we'll go one task at a time. And so let's start um, with aggregating. So when I'm talking about aggregation, it is the way that we start to look at trends, that we can see trends in data sets. It's often where you discover the so what about the data. What are the conclusions that I can draw? And it can be tricky to aggregate data meaningfully. You really do need to understand your data set and what it is that you're looking at and what you're saying when you draw your conclusions. So let's say that we had the question, um, you know, I'm, I'm a New Yorker, New York City based. What time of day do New York City parks need the most servicing? So let's say that's my question for our folks. Um, so it, this here would be uh, an example of a chart that somebody might give in order to answer that question. So you can see here, this is New York City 311 service requests. Those are open data that's available to all, um, anybody on the internet. We can see the date range that they pulled and we can see these bars um, here in front of us. And if I were to look at that, um, 
what would you say in the chat box? What would you say is the time of day that New York City parks need the most servicing? Anybody can respond. I'll repeat the question. Um, so if we're asking what time of day do New York City parks need the most servicing and you were to look at this chart as the answer, what would you think that the, the answer is? So I'm seeing 10 a.m., afternoon, noon, yep. Yeah, you can see that most of the bars, the highest time, you're right, is around 10 o'clock to into the afternoon, around two-ish maybe. Cecily says it's too old for her small eye or for her old eyes. Too small for her old eyes. Um, Faith, it's a little too small. Um, so for those of you who responded, yes, absolutely. Um, that is what this chart is telling us around lunch break range. And Kidian, Kidian, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. You are hitting on exactly the point that I'm looking to make here. If we're looking to answer what time of day do New York City parks need the most uh, servicing, and we're looking at service requests, we know that these are the calls that are made to get service completed. But is that necessarily when the parks are the dirtiest? Or is that perhaps the time that people are taking their lunch break and in the park and notice that there's an issue and are calling in? There's a difference between when people are calling and when the issue is actually taking place or when it began or uh, when it's first needed. Um, and this just gets to the point of how difficult aggregation can be. Again, you really need to know your data, where these data points come from and um, what you're saying when you're aggregating that information. So it's just my little PSA when we're talking about aggregation. All right, so let's get started. Um, if you are joining me in the slide deck, we are on slide 11. So come on over to slide 11 and you can download the slide deck here by clicking on that link. Once you download it, go ahead and just open it up. And this deck is, um, I keep calling it a deck, I'm thinking of slides, but it's not, it's my Excel spreadsheet. Um, and this Excel spreadsheet comes from Open Data, New York City Open Data. These are 311 noise complaints that we'll be looking at. And so um, these are calls that people are calling in, New Yorkers are calling in specifically around noise complaints. Something is too noisy for them. And more specifically, this is taking place in March of this year. So there are a lot of New Yorkers and also we may or may not complain a lot about the noise that's around us. Um, because if I were to even just take year to date, it would be a data set that's far too large for um, Excel to handle. So we will just look at March for today. Um, so when we are working in Excel, um, you know, some of the first things that I do when I open up a spreadsheet is just orient myself to that spreadsheet. Um, so I'm just going to scroll through that top row um, are the different categories of information that we have. So I can see there's a created date and a closed date. We have the agency. And what that is, is the agency that the calls are being rooted to. Agency name, complaint type and descriptor. So this is a more general category. The descriptor is more specific. We've got our location type. We've got the zip code and the address of the incident. We've got cross streets and intersections. We've got the city in which it took place, any landmarks that they submitted, whether the issue is closed, in progress, or open. We've got a resolution description, so that's some qualitative data in here. 
Um, we've got the community board. Um, so that's like specifically, I guess it's like neighborhood is a way of looking at it. It's really a political thing. Um, we've got the borough, we've got X and Y coordinates. We've got all sorts of data in here that we can look at and pull from longitude, latitude. So that kind of just helps me to orient what type of data we have to play with. Um, then I like to just make it look and feel the way that's most helpful for me to um, work with that data. Sneha, I just put the link into the, um, the chat for you. So um, the first thing I like to do is just, just freeze my top row. So if I were to scroll down, I instantly lose what these categories represent. And while we just walked through it once and maybe you could intuit, it's just so much easier to see the names of these column headers. And so to do that, I will go up to my view tab. So up here, the view ribbon. And then there's um, a couple of buttons I could use. I could use freeze panes, freeze top row, and freeze first column. Um, so I'm just gonna select freeze top row. And you can see that now that I'm scrolling, it's frozen. Um, okay, so I like to do that. Sometimes I like to just make it stand out a little bit. So I'm going to make it bold. I'll just hit Control B. Um, I like to make it a little bit bigger so it's easier to read. Uh, you could change the color of the background if you want. Just anything to make it look nice. Now, the next thing that I'm seeing that's annoying me is that um, now that I changed the font size, it looks really squished. And also these columns, I can't fully read the data that's in here. Um, so there are a couple ways to <clears throat> adjust the size of the columns. The first and most basic way, <coughs> excuse me, is to hover between any two columns and just drag. And that'll fix the size for you. Um, I could highlight all of the com columns that I want to adjust. And if I click and drag then, it makes them all exactly the same size. My favorite way, though, is to just highlight the entire data set. And the way that you do that is just by clicking in this upper left-hand corner. You can see that half or that triangle right there. So click there. That will highlight absolutely everything, every cell in your data set. And then if you just double click in between any two cells, it will auto size every single column for you. So now it is exactly the size that it needs to be so that you can read the longest line of text in there. And then I'm going to do the same thing for my rows too because I made the text size a little too large um, and it just looks squished. So I'm just gonna double click in between any two rows and it will do the same thing. So now this looks so much nicer. All right, so the next thing I wanna show you are quick keys. So I am the type of person who will work in Excel and I like to keep my hands on the keyboard. If I don't need to move to the mouse, I don't want to. And so quick keys become really helpful here. I just used one of them when I made the text bold, control B. You can use them to scoot around this, the spreadsheet as well. So if you were to hit um, either control and then the arrow keys, or if you're on a Mac, it's the command button. Um, so hit command and then the down arrow, it will jump you to the very bottom of the spreadsheet. So I can see that there are 51,458 records in here. That 59th would be the top row. And you can do the same thing to go all the way right. I'll hit command right or control right. You'll notice that it stops when there's a gap in the data. So I'm not all the way to the right yet. It'll just pause every time that there's a gap. And so you can just keep, keep hitting control right to keep moving over. Um, what else can I tell you? Oh, something that's extremely helpful um, is highlighting large swaths of data. So um, if I wanted to highlight a column, I can just click on the column uh, header. If I want to highlight multiple, I can click on that letter and drag. Same thing with my rows. If I want to highlight just a, um, say I want to highlight from row 20 down, I can put my cursor or my activate cell A20. And then you can hit command and shift 
and then your up, down, left, right. And that will highlight as you're jumping around. So go ahead and hit con command or control shift and down, and it will highlight all the way down to the bottom. And then if I hit right, it'll highlight over until the first break in the data. So it's a way of highlighting. One thing that I'll say as a warning is that if I jump up in my data set, um, you can see that it, it looks like I'm not in A1 because we're jumping from one to 5,000 or 51,396. Um, you just need to make sure you hit down once. Just make sure with this freezing, you're really at the top of your data set once you start doing any sort of manipulation. All right, so that is just kind of how I move around the spreadsheets. So let's start talking about, um, the shift really is magical. Um, let's start talking about aggregating this information, what the first task in data and, and analytics. Um, so if you go over to the dashboard tab, um, so another nice thing about Excel, if you're totally new to it, is that you can have a spreadsheet, and that's my raw data here, but you can add tabs down here. So you can have multiple spreadsheets in here, you can create dashboards, you can create you know, pivot tables, whatever it is that you want, all inside of one Excel document. So down here, um, click over to the dashboard, and we've got the template for a dashboard. So let's say that we want to make this table um, at the top, and we want to look at which borough has the most complaints. And I want to be able to fill in the number of complaints here for starting with the Bronx. If I were to look at this spreadsheet, I'm just thinking through, okay, what is it that I need to be able to do? And essentially what I need to be able to do is I know that there is a column with the borough in here. Here it is, it's column Z. And so what I want Excel to be able to do is to scan column Z and every row that it finds Bronx, I want it to count one. And so now that I know logically what I want it to do, I know, cause I know Excel, that count if is the formula that I want. So this is a conditional logic formula. Um, and this en enables us to count, but only if a certain condition is met. So let me show you what I mean by that. Every formula in Excel begins with an equal sign. And then I'll begin typing in count if. Once I do, you can either open up your parentheses to begin the formula, or you can click on the count if text. Either way, you'll get to this, uh, this view. Now, one of the helpful things about Excel is that they give you little uh, kind of like prompts for what the ingredients for this uh, formula are. If you have any questions you want to read about the count if formula, you can click on that hyperlink that says count if. It'll open up the Excel help for you, which I do find helpful. Um, this reminds me a lot of R, if you're familiar with it, where it'll tell you the syntax, it'll give you examples, it'll tell you the ingredients in the formula. So here it's prompting me through. I can see that there are two elements to the count if formula. The first one is range, and that's the one that we're on right now. That's the one that's blue, bold, and underlined. The next one will be criteria. So it's saying, okay, um, if I, if you want me to count, what do you, what do you want me to look for? Or I'm sorry, not what do you want me to look for? Where do you want me to look? What's the range in which you want me to scan? So I'm going to go to my raw data. I'm going to find column Z, and I'm just going to highlight it. So you can see already we're able to work with formulas across different tabs, which is a really nice thing. I don't need to put my counted formula on this raw data spreadsheet. I can keep it as the raw data and have a totally different tab with this, this formula on it. The same thing applies across spreadsheets. So if you have this document and a different document and you wanna to refer to a totally different file, you can do that. Okay, so we can see that it filled in, uh, it wants, it's saying go to the raw data tab and then look in column Z. So I'm going to type a comma and that will progress me to the next element in this uh, formula, and that's the criteria. And it's essentially saying, what do you want me to look for? Once I'm scanning Z, what do you want me to look for? And we wanted to look for Bronx. 
two things that are important. Number one, if you're typing any sort of characters, you need to put them in quotation marks. Number two, it is case sensitive. So we can't just type Bronx, capital B, lowercase, everything else. We need to type it exactly as it's going to find it here. So I'm going to open up my, my quotation marks and I'll type Bronx in all capital letters. I'll close my quotation marks. When I'm done with the formula, I'll also close the, the parentheses and I'll hit enter. And it's as easy as that. So now we can see very easily that um, there are 11,000 about um, noise complaints coming from the Bronx in the month of March. Now, um, there's a couple of things that you can do. One thing that I will do is just copy this formula down and then edit it as opposed to rewriting the formula every time. The fastest way to copy this data, you could either hit control C and then highlight and control V. Even faster than that is you can see that this cell is activated with a green border. You can see the green um, box in the bottom right hand corner. As soon as I hover over it, notice my mouse pointer. It's a white plus right now. And as soon as I hover over that green box, it turns into a black crosshairs. That's when you stop moving your mouse, you'll click and just drag and it will carry down what the formula was in that, that cell. So now I've got the formula to look for the Bronx in every single one of these cells. And I just wanna change the text. Um, so I'm just going to go down to Brooklyn's cell. So that would be C5. And I double clicked on the Bronx value and I'll type Brooklyn instead. So open quotation marks, Brooklyn and all uppercase, close your quotation marks and then hit enter. I'm just going to keep doing that for each of these. Oops, I don't want to do that. Queens. And then I'm just going to double check how Staten Island is abbreviated. Yeah, it's just written out. No abbreviation. Great. Okay, so that's count if um, in a nutshell. Um, if we want to fill in the total, that's a new formula. Um, and you can type equals sum. Um, so sum will just add up whatever set of um, cells that you want to add. So I'm just going to highlight the five cells that we just created those formulas for. And what's beautiful is that Excel doesn't read the formulas. It reads the values that came out of those formulas. So I can add up all of those values. And there it is with the sum formula. Reshima is asking, is there an option to do uppercase Bronx? That's a good question. Let's try it. I bet there is. Um, so that would require some nesting. Um, so there's the formula uppercase. We're just upper now. Um, so I could type in Bronx and close it. So now I'm saying the criteria is Bronx, but I didn't want to hit my caps locks or hold shift while I was typing it because, you know, that's a little annoying. And if I were to do that, yep, it absolutely works. You got a nice little preview into something that, you know, I talk about later in the slides, which is nesting formulas. So you can take formulas which are strong in and of themselves, and then you can build with them. So nest them inside of each other and the formula becomes even more powerful. <laughs> Thanks for asking. All right, so um, I guess worth mentioning before I move on, I'm aware of time and how many things there are to show you. Um, but I do want to show you that you can also do mathematical um, formulas in here, too. They also begin with an equal sign. So if we wanted to figure out the percent of complaints out of the total, so which borough had the highest percent of complaints, um, I would just type an equal sign. I would select the Bronx to start there. Divide is a forward slash. And then I'd select the total cell. So 22% of the complaints in March came from the Bronx. Okay, um, let us move on just in the keeping in mind time. Um, okay, so just as I said, you know, these slides have 
you know, exactly the steps that I'm, I'm going through to show you. So we've got the functions, you've got the count if fu function here, it's got the elements, all of it is here for you to refer to. Um, you can see what I just did with um, the mathematical formula, plus is a plus sign, minus is the little dash, multiplication is asterisk, and divide is that forward slash. All right, um, so let's say that we wanted to answer the question, okay, that's interesting how the boroughs break down with their complaints, but what's the most frequent complaint type? What are people actually complaining about? Um, this is where we get into a space where what I just showed you using formulas and creating your own dashboard can be really handy. It has its place, especially again, if you're creating a template that you're giving to folks. Um, but as you start building the number of rows in your table, it can become really tedious really quickly. So writing all these formulas for five rows, it's a lot, but doable. Once we start adding in 20, 30 rows, it becomes a, a burden. And so there is a faster way. And I argue that this is the best feature in Excel. And that's the pivot table. So let me walk you through how we go from this raw data set to this table in an even faster way than what we just did. And once you know pivot tables, I don't think you ever go back to something like this and, unless you have to. Um, so when it comes to pivot tables, essentially these create aggregate tables based on whatever values you want to pull into it. Um, and you can insert a pivot table by um, selecting any one cell in your data set, going up to the insert ribbon and selecting that very first button, the pivot table button. So I'll click on that. And I'm just going to hit OK. The biggest decision that you have to make here, it will select the data that you want. And I have honestly never had it select the incorrect amount of data. Your biggest choice here is do you want it in a new worksheet or in the existing? I, I always want it in a new one. I don't want to mess up my raw data in any way. So I'm truly just going to click OK. Um, Let's see, is there a place to copy templates from with nice tables with colors and headers? I don't know. So um, I know that, um, it's a good question, Reshima. I know that they do have templates built into Excel. So if you see something in the free templates, you can scan those. If I create something that I really like, I can save it as a template and share it with folks so they can create whatever they want to in that template. People have free and then they sell templates online. And then something I didn't show, but maybe is worth showing really quickly, is I can turn this into what Excel calls a table which also makes it a little bit easier to read. So I'm not sure exactly what kind of template you're looking for, but if what you're referring to is just this idea that um, maybe even just every other cell is highlighted, so it's a little easier to track across the rows, which rows data is which, um, you can also go into, I don't do this too often, but let me look really quickly, I think. Oh, I should have looked before I did this. Maybe I have to highlight all the data first. Okay, I'm going to look it up. When I'm not on the spot, I'll think of it immediately. But you can select all of this data. Oh, is it insert? No. Yeah, it's insert table. Mm, yeah, I don't want to do that. All right. I will get back to you all with this one. But essentially, you can create a table out of this. And if you're in the um, chat box, if you're familiar with Excel and you remember what I'm missing, um, you can just very easily turn this into a table. It's a little bit easier to analyze. Oh, yes, you can copy and paste that table for sure. Yes. Um, OK, so we are going to look at pivot tables really quickly. So we created this new tab um, 
And on this new tab, there are two sections. The first one over here is where the pivot table will be created. The second section is over here. Um, this, these are the pivot table fields. This is where the magic happens. It's like the control panel for your pivot table. You'll see up here um, as we scroll through, these are all of the different column headers um, that were in the data set. Um, and essentially what you do is take any of these and sort them into one of these four panes. The most common ones that you will use are the bottom two, the rows and the values. Rows gives you the different values um, in your table. So if I wanted to pull burrow in, it would give me all of the burrows. And then values gives you the summary, the sum if. Um, so the question for us is, what's the most com common complaint type? And so I'll find complaint type, I'll click on it, and I'll just drag it right down into rows. And so now I can see all of the different types of complaints. There's commercial, helicopter, houses of worship, which always cracks me up, um, park, residential, street, sidewalk, and vehicle. And then I'll take complaint type again, and I'll drag it down into values. And as easy as that, no formulas needed, I have created a table that shows you exactly the number of complaints for each of these complaint types. I'm going to pause here. I see Cecily is asking a question. She said, her problem with pivot tables is not knowing enough to know which axis should be columns and which should be rows. Yeah, so pivot tables can get really complicated really quickly, right? Um, so this is the most simple. This is like the training wheels for pivot tables. What you can do is add to it. Um, so if I wanted to know a breakdown of the different complaints, but also um, how they break up among burrow, I can add burrow in here. So I'll look for burrow. Let me just search for it. There it is. And if I click and drag that into columns, watch what happens. Now I've got a beautiful table. And it's got the burrows along the columns. We've got the rows as the um, types of complaints and then all of the data in between. Worth noting that you can filter these. Um, so for instance, the column labels, you can see the little filter button here. It's that little box um, to the right of column labels. You can just select and unselect the data that you want included. So for instance, unspecified is not helpful to us. I'm just going to uncheck it and it will get rid of it. That once I do, ad adjusts the grand totals for us automatically. Um, and so, yeah, I hear you, Cecily, especially when you're creating visualizations. So why don't we dive into the counterpart to this, which is creating visualizations. Um, so there are pivot tables and then their complement are pivot charts. And these charts are directly linked to the pivot table. So I can edit the table and the chart will immediately respond to it. Um, it's just a really nice way of playing with the data. You can see the numbers then and you can also look at how they're visualized to look for trends or drill down as you will. The way that you enter pivot charts is just by collecting, clicking that button up here. It's in the insert ribbon. So I'll go ahead and do that. And you can see here, get a little bigger, um, what my pivot chart looks like. So it guessed which kind of chart I wanted. We've got a clustered bar chart here. And we've got it arranged in clusters based on the type of complaint. The main category is that type of complaint, my x-axis type of complaint. And that was the one that I put into the axis, right, the categories. And then it's clarified by or broken down by burrow. And so you can see those are the different color bars in each of these complaint types. So if I wanted the reverse, if I wanted to look at them by burrow and see which ones are the highest, how these complaint types compare, I would just need to flip these. So I'd take burrow and put it in axis and then look at this mess for a second, which actually can be helpful also. So let's pause here. Um, so this is another way of visualizing it, right? So it's pretty much the same chart, but instead of having different color bars, we just have them all labeled in here. So it's another way of looking at it. 
Um, I will show you that if I take burrow and I move it above complaint type, it gives you a whole different view. Now we're looking at each of cluster is the burrow. And now we've got individually labeled complaint types. Still not the most helpful or visually appealing for me. I'm going to take complaint type and just move it over to legend and watch what happens. So now we've got the complaint types and those are the different colored bars. And we've got them clustered by burrow. Oops, this over there so you can see. There we go. Um, what was I going to say about this? Oh, even for me, I might um, edit this a little bit further. When I've got a lot of bars, I kind of like to have them stacked. Um, so if I wanted to change the chart type, I would right click on the chart itself um, and I'd go down to change chart type. And there are lots of different types just to show you really quickly. You can do your bars. You can do 3D bars if you're into those. Um, you can do vertical bars. Uh, or sorry, horizontal bars. Um, you've got line charts, you've got area charts, 3D charts, you've got pie and donut, um, hierarchy, statistics, combo charts, maps. You can do little mapping, it's a little limited. I wanna show you stacked, stacked column. I think that's so much cleaner. Um, it begins to call out some trends. So I can see Manhattan had the most complaints of all of the boroughs. I can see that um, the green, whatever green is, noise residential, is the most common across all of the different boroughs. It doesn't matter which one they're complaining about their neighbors the most. Um, if you want to begin editing this further, let's say I want my bars closer together, for instance. I can right click on any of the bars um, and I'll select format data series. And there are so many different options in here. Um, and actually the one that I'm looking for is right here, gap width. I can just make it smaller um, and it'll bring these bars closer together. Series overlap, oh no, we don't wanna play with that. <laughs> um, but gap width, great. Now they're a little bit fatter, a little closer together. Um, let's say that I wanted to add in, um, some data labels, um, I can select, again, any bar and right click. And there's an option for add data labels. And I'll go ahead and do that. Now, of course, it's adding a data label for every single bar in here. I might want to get rid of some of the smaller ones. If you want to even pull them out, I could select on a specific label and pull it out. It'll draw the line to it. There's just a little too much data in here, to be honest with you, to make this helpful. Um, I can change the colors, though. If I want to change the green to, say, pink, um, I can select once. Um, you can see how each of those green bars are highlighted or segments are highlighted. I can right click um, and I'll select format data series. Here is the paint can. I'll select that button and then I can change the fill color. So let's find some pink. There we go. And I'll select OK. Now it's well, it's more like a purple here, but there's that. You can change the border color. So if I want it to be black, um, for instance, I can do that. And now it's got a solid black border. If I want to change the color, so up here, like the data label is too dark for the dark blue, I can just um, right click again, format data labels. Um, and then I can select, oh, text options. So up here is text options, text fill, and I want to make the color white instead. And now it's white. There's so many different things I could show you. Um, you can change when it comes to your labels if you want the name um, of the complaint in there. I often do that when I'm creating a pie chart. Um, gosh, you can change the position of the data label in there. Just so many different things that you can play around with when you're just kind of customizing this to look and feel the way you want it to. I see the time. I want to make sure that we stay true to the one o'clock cutoff. I want to give you a chance to ask questions. So go ahead in the chat box, just pop in any questions, any last minute things that I might be able to point out to you. 
And while you're doing that, I will just say that there are so many more slides here than what we covered. We covered a pretty nice overview of what's here, but feel free to go through um, the slides and just look at what else is possible, right? You can see the visualizing next and the customization that's there. Um, there's a nice chart chooser in here that I love to use when I'm trying to figure out a good or like a different type of visualization than the standard bar charts. Um, I love creating heat maps. You can find out how to do that and it automatically makes a certain color like the highest number either green or red and then varies in between. Um, filtering is in here and sorting is in here how to do that. We played with it a little bit in the pivot chart. And then the other thing that I would call your attention to is just looking at manipulation. That's always everybody's favorite. And that's where we use formulas to change the data to what we want. So there's a choose function that I go over at the if function, um, you know, what logical functions are, um, lots of information in there. Um, there is an example of VLOOKUP. I put that in just for Eurasia. So yes, you can walk through a VLOOKUP. Essentially, we'll take two different data sets and we'll pull in data from one of the data sets into your main data set that you need so that you don't have to go through and by hand pick out. Um, let's say that um, for this example, it pulls in the borough population based off of the U.S. Census. So instead of having to go through and in this table, um, putting in what the borough population was for each of these, you can do a VLOOKUP and just pull it out of a different data set. So it's a really handy tool. Once you master it, it's very helpful. Um, okay. And then just to kind of put you, if you're newer to um, just uh, analysis in general and just kind of want to understand where these skills fall on the range. What we just went over, so uh, I, my company teaches so many different um, classes and different varying levels. What we just went over was a little mix of Excel for data analysis one and two. Um, VLOOKUP is more of one of the advanced skills. Um, so you can see, you know, there's concepts around just data being data driven. What does that mean? How do we use data to drive the work that we do? That's kind of some of the basics. And then we build the skills of how do you how do you do the actual analyses? So there's Excel, um, there's data visualization, like you can learn and dive into exactly what that looks like, uh, whole classes. Um, dashboarding is, again, its own kind of class, its own skill, its own concept. If any of you are Queens residents, I'll be, I'm teaching a dashboarding class um, for the Queens Public Library. We're in class number two of four. Um, it's on Wednesdays from 3.30 to 5. So check out their library. You'll find a link to it. But that's dashboarding and free dashboarding. And then these are more of the advanced skills. So I, I know most of you are probably fall in this area where you know R, Python, SQL, GIS, um, even just advanced st stats. But this is kind of you know the realm of the work that we do. Um, you can read about the different classes here. You can sign up for a newsletter. I like to send out tips and tricks um, if you're interested in that. I have at the end some Microsoft Excel resources for you to look at um, if you want to just expand your Excel skills in general. And there's my contact information. I welcome you to send me any questions that you have if you want me to, to talk you through anything at all. Um, I'm most happy to respond and help you out. And thank you so much for coming today. Um, it was nice meeting you all. I hope this was helpful. And again, if you, you have any other questions, let me know. Thanks, Liz. Um, yeah, everybody, if you have any more questions, feel free to ask on chat. Now is a good time. Um, now is a good time because we have the speaker. We have Liz right here to answer the questions. I'm really looking forward to looking through these slides um, and seeing all the other um, all the other options. Okay, I'm glad it was helpful. Yeah. Good, my pleasure. All right, y'all have a great afternoon or morning or evening wherever in the world that you are. Right.
Thank you, everyone.